I had been working with Paula for several years on other cases and field investigations, and I've got about 120 field investigations with MUFON International under my belt. And what was really great was being able to work with you, Paula, and Jacques together. There was a great sense of teamwork there because we were out, you know, in the middle of nowhere and watching out for rattlesnakes and going up inclines and, and going into the dry arroyos looking for the uh, remnants of other metal pieces or fragments of the crash site. And it was just a, a great team atmosphere and both of you engaging in discussions with each other on um, what you thought, you know, how we should move forward. And we had Geiger counters, we had metal detectors, shovels, and taking samples. So it was very professional and very thorough. And, and that was a really exciting, exciting experience. So thank you again. So um, Jacques, for you, what in particular about this case interested you so much that you wanted to pursue it? Well, I've been, of course, interested in the physics of this entire problem for a long, long time. I've published about, about this, I've published about the analysis of samples from a, a dozen cases around the world. As you may know, I've, uh, I'm a member of the Scientific Commission in France under the French Space Agency that is looking at, at the whole problem. Uh, I started doing uh, investigations in New Mexico about five or six years ago with a couple of friends of mine in different areas. And then I became aware of the, the history of this particular site in San Antonio in 1945. So, uh, and then I became aware of the fact that Paola had already been working on that case for three or four years and had uh, accumulated a number of uh, photographs and interviews, including a very critical interview of one of the two prime witnesses who, uh, by the time I became involved and you became involved, uh, Bill, had, uh, had passed away. So we, we had that background, including the first interview of the first witness. The second witness, uh, Jose Padilla, is very much alive now. And we've had the, you know, the opportunity to uh, go back to the site several times with Paola and, and track the different directions of, of the investigation. What is unusual about it as compared to Roswell, and in fact, it, it highlights many of the things that we had learned about Roswell, about the whole phenomenon through Roswell, but this is two years before. So the Kenneth Arnold case has not happened. The Roswell crash has not happened. The, the word flying saucer is not in the English <laughs> language. Nice. You know, people don't know what this thing is. It, it arrives out of nowhere. It hits this tower, you know, and uh, showers landscape with a residue of, of very strange metal and then does a, a crash, which is really a controlled crash. And one of the interesting things is that it, it seems when we reconstruct the, the energy involved and the, the traces in the landscape, that that thing was under power all the time until it stopped. So this is not a crash in the sense of uh, Roswell, for example, where they all of a sudden, you know, everything was all over the, the landscape in, in scattered. Here, the, the object was a large avocado. I think it's a good description of it. There is no flying saucer there. This is a, a, an oval shaped object, the size of a large uh, tractor trailer. And uh, it makes this controlled emergency landing um, there are two witnesses who are on the site. That also is exceptional because they see 
the whole thing. They first hear it. They hear the collision with the tower when the, the object bumps into this communication tower. And then they actually see the brush catching fire. The object never caught fire, but they see the brush. They see the, the traces in the ground as a thing literally plows a, uh, a, a boulevard down the hill the size of a football field. Okay, this is any airplane would have been shattered into 10,000 pieces at this point. This thing is extremely strong, it's heavy, it's under control. And then the, the, the kids are watching it, thinking, and here we have to go back to the time, 1945. Japan capitulated two days ago. Most men, most able-bodied men in the United States are still in uniform. The, the soldiers who are going to be asked to come and retrieve this thing come from White Sands and they are 18, 20 year old kids essentially who are still in uniform, uh, have not been demobilized and they are going to improvise how do we carry this thing out? And the kids are going to be there every day except the second day. But all the successive seven days after that, the kids are there watching everything. And uh, Jose Padilla and Remy remembered every detail of what happened. And so the case is exceptional from all of those different dimensions. Right. And you mentioned uh, Remy and Jose, and at that time, they were, I believe, six years old and nine years old, correct? Yes. Seven and nine. Yes. And to me, one of the things that was interesting was, as you said, they had no vocabulary for UFO or anything like that. They were just kids. And so they brought a sense of innocence, it seemed to me, in their descriptions of um, when they describe the the beings that they saw in the ship, can you describe that? Well, it's well known, I think, in uh, accident investigation that kids are in some ways better than adults at describing, uh, you know, an accident because they don't project, they don't try to impress you with how much they know and so on. They may not have a complete vocabulary. But usually kids are more precise and factual about exactly what happened without putting in interpretations on top of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, we got there. They, they were kids, but they were sophisticated kids. Uh, they were in charge of uh, the reason they were on that property was they were in charge of um, maintenance and in charge of following the cattle, making sure they were there because there was a, a cow had just had a calf and they needed to find a calf and uh, so that it could be branded. They uh, had powerful binoculars to read the markings on cattle. Mm -hmm. That property is extremely large. It's 80,000 acres. So they, they are on horseback and they know every corner of that land. It's their, their property. As opposed to so many cases, for example, at Waswell, nobody knew. People knew that something had fallen, but they were not sure exactly where. And if there was one crash or two, I mean, we still don't know uh, exactly all the details of what happened. And it took a couple of days for people to get to the site. Here we have the witnesses there, it's their land. They know everything about it. They know how to hide and they are going to be hiding from the soldiers, uh, sometimes just a hundred feet away or 200 feet away in the, in the brush uh, following intently. You know, this is fascinating to them. How are they going to get that thing out of there? The, so th those kids are sophisticated. They, uh, uh, Jose, the nine-year-old, drives a truck, drives a family truck. All the men are gone. I mean, they are in uniform, scattered all over the place. The, somebody needs to take, take care of the cattle, take care of the property, and the family relies on them. So they are responsible kids 
they 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 know that you know there is no question they have to to do the chores they had to fix the fences they have to do all of that so we have in a way we have the ideal witnesses there and uh they report day by day what they've seen and in the book and in the investigation with paola we have been able to reconstruct everything including when it was raining when when it you know the temperature extremes of temperature every day during that entire thing and the exact dates until the army was able to uh, load this you know about five ton object you know give or take maybe two tons on a, a tractor trailer and take it out of there on the road that the army had to construct to take it out okay so this is a long fairly long operation yeah, you know, you bring up a good point because in all these details, what people need to understand is how thoroughly you and Paolo research this. I mean, like you said, the, the the day, the temperature, and and the different the different hiding spots that uh, you know Remy and Jose took over the course of those days, viewing the crash site with this army soldiers through the binoculars, and um, you know. What, in your opinion, Jacques, is the significance of this case and how does it affect ufology and mankind? So you can ask that question and that's you know, something that Paola and I have discussed many times. You can ask the question at two different levels. There is the ufology ufology 101 <laughs> level if you want okay <laughs> the kinds of things that we you know with with mufon and with other groups and so on and among scientists we discuss all the time you know what what does it mean what does the shape of the object mean what what about propulsion i mean what was inside i mean three people have gone inside this object okay after the there were some beings there the first day that they were not seen afterwards. We don't know what happened to them. But after that, the object was lying there empty. Um, the father of Jose, Faustino Padilla, went inside with a state policeman whom he had called to when the kids reported it. They went inside. They spent time inside the, the object. And then the um, the kids, especially Jose, Mr. Padilla, went inside on the last day when the soldiers were not around and the object had been loaded on the truck and was ready to be to be driven to be driven away. And after that was never seen again, but he had a chance to go inside also. So we have testimony which is unique. And these people were not inside because they were abducted. They were inside because they they walked up inside the object. They mm -hmm. climbed inside, and they could describe, you know, the the dimensions very precisely. And they could describe what was what was inside. So that's the that level, which is the uh, you know ufology level. We want to know, you know, that, that is there an engine? Well. We know the dimension of the object. It was about 15 feet high. Inside was about 12 or 13 feet high. That leaves a space below the floor, which is the only place where there could have been an engine, but there were no openings there. The object, during the crash, the object did not fall apart. There was only one panel that was detached. So the, the underside was scratched was metal it was right. scratched but it was not broken so the, and there was no opening so nobody knows what kind of engine if there is mm -hmm. such a thing as an engine you know it would have been in that space but we don't know what what it was so we have all these questions so it's like every time in research right. you you answer one question and you have 10 more okay sure. now the other level is why would something like that intervene? Remember, we are we are outside White Sands perimeter, but we are within the a perimeter controlled by the army. I mean, mm -hmm. that tower is a communication tower that marks the northern edge 
of the White Sands Range, which is a military range, and of course, a range where the first atomic explosion in the world has just taken place one month, exactly four weeks before, okay? And um, the, this object comes out of nowhere and it crashes there. Is there a message there? I mean, is there a message right. to the United States and to the world? Okay, this is a turning point in the history of the world. You know, the nuclear power has mm -hmm. been revealed, has right. been you know, discovered and, and revealed mm -hmm. through a bomb. What does that mean for you know the history of the world after that? For history of people like you and me who were, you know, born after that event. Okay, this you can think of that entire case as a donation. You know, here you know you've just discovered that. Now look at this. Okay, this object that has no propulsion, no visible propulsion, no propellers, no jets. Know, but can maneuver, can can uh, land under power, can uh, can can do all those things, and by the way, the crew is humanoid, three creatures who breathe our air, uh, and apparently communicate with the kids in a very interesting way that we have to call psychic, for lack of a better term. Oh, but the, yeah. the kids, uh, they, they describe, oh, we were there maybe 20 minutes. And then when you reconstruct the time, they were there two hours. Right. Well, you know, I've had two kids. Uh, you know, I remember when they were seven or nine, I couldn't keep them quiet for two hours. <laughs> you know, there's no, no way. So uh, what happened there? What was the nature of that communication, which, right. by the way, changed their lives, changed their entire lives? Right. So Jacques, do you think that you're saying when you, you mentioned it was a controlled crash and it was almost as if it was a donation, do you think those beings, it was almost like a sacrificial crash intentional to wake people up to the message of the dangers of nuclear warfare? It, it's hard to, so that's another area of questions again, that we open up when, you know, every discovery creates mm -hmm. 10 questions. Uh, if, if we take the, uh, you know, the common approach of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, we don't see the people looking at, you know, life in the universe as we define it from science today, we don't expect that creatures from Alpha Centauri would be necessarily humanoid. They may be somewhat, no, they would have to have some of the same functions we have, but sure. we wouldn't expect them to have two eyes, you know, one nose, one mouth, two arms. They are, if we look at the variety of biology on earth, you know, look at all the different forms of animals that could have evolved into the intelli an intelligent species. So uh, we don't expect to find humanoids who breathe our air, you know. Uh, the, they were moving in strange ways. They were not walking. They were just moving from one area to the other, sort of sliding suddenly. Mm. They seem to be in distress. They seem to be crying and the, the kids, the kids were crying at that point because they thought these beings were, you know, had had, of course, an, an accident that they wanted to help them. They, Jose wanted to go there yeah. and help. Remember, again, this was World War II, okay? Uh, I remember World War II. I was, I was five at the end of World War II, but I remember the liberation of France. I remember the battle for Paris. I remember all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my parents and I were in the middle of that. So the you, you learn quickly as a kid, you know, you, you, you understand tanks, you understand, you know, uh, anti-aircraft guns, 
you understand airplanes, you, 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 you see the war around you. So they were, um, their, their instinct was, there has been a crash, we need to help. We're the first people on, on the site. Mm -hmm. We need to call for help. Uh, when they realized what was in front of them, they, I think they understood that they, they didn't know how to help, that this was completely unexpected. They, these were not humans. And it, uh, Paola has done an extraordinary job of recalling every step of that in her interviews. And we yeah. have very rich interviews of again and again of both Remy and Jose separately. Mm -hmm. uh, now I've been trained, you know, working with computers and language and, you know, translation of uh, AI applied to language to analyze words, okay? And the, the words they use that we transcribe very carefully in, in, in the book, I want mm -hmm. you to be very faithful to, you know, uh, uh, Paola's interviews, uh, sometimes they, they switch. They, they go from talking about the beings as, as humanoids or creatures, and then sometimes as men or little men. Mm -hmm. um, when she pushes them, she compares them to, uh, to insects, um, uh, you know, to, uh, and they use different words, both in, in English and in Spanish. Campamocha, which is a, uh, you know, an, a, an insect that looks almost humanoid, like a large ant. You right. know? Uh, and uh, the, but then they relate to them as they, you know, I, I think one of them says at one time, they look like little kids like us, you know, they, mm -hmm. there was a sort of psychic feeling. Jose wants to go and help because again, that's a war, something crashes, you want to lend, you know, to bring help. Uh, Remy says, no way, I don't want any of that. He's crying, he's, you know, in, 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 in a big crisis. Both of them are going to have recurring dreams later on for years, okay? That, and we can relate that to other cases that we know from the UFO literature, okay, and in the book with, you know, with we've brought in uh, parallels with other well-researched cases that were researched officially, you know, like Socorro and like mm -hmm. Valençol in France, which was researched by the French government, several agencies of the French government, including the military. There is no question, both of those cases, you know, are close parallels to what happened in New Mexico. And all three cases involve a novel object that looks like an avocado. Mm -hmm. There is no disc in any of the three cases. And they, they involve humanoid beings that are short about, you know, about three to four feet and breathe air. They don't have a helmet. Yeah, that's that's fascinating and that you can make those correlations to the other cases too, to validate them. So I know Jose at that time, he was able to recover a piece of metal from the crash site. And I believe you've had it tested. So can you tell us about your findings of that metal piece? So we, he was generous in turning it over to, to us. Um, we, again, it, it, raises more questions than, than it answers. Um, it was attached, well, the, the object itself is a, a, a bracket similar to uh, a kind of, of um, uh, a kind of, of, of instrument you would find in a, uh, in a mechanical device where you need to transfer, mm -hmm. well, I, uh, I, I have a similar thing. This is smaller. This is an industrial thing that that uh, Paola actually bought uh, from a shop. And you, you can see, you know, it can turn over an axis, mm -hmm. and it, but it has attachments 
here and here that can, it's an actuator, you know. So you could find that in some some old aircraft. You and just to find clarify that that, that that piece you're showing is not the piece from this. This is, is not the piece, no. But it's uh, the, the, the piece itself is, you know, is similar. It's larger and it has more more different attachments. But it's in terms of the function, it's that kind of function of transferring motion and actuating on different things that are attached to this rotating object. Okay. So it has a central axis, just like this one, and it's going to rotate around that. And it now they we the part we don't have is the panel that was attached to the wall of the object that uh, Jose couldn't get loose because this was attached securely. Uh, it was a, a circle that looked like a big copper circle. It would have been about this big and, and the, uh, the, the bracket would have been turning around it, around it, possibly making some sort of contact. So having said that, we're still looking for what the function could be, the the difficulty is that the 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 bracket itself doesn't have a brand. We know what it, the composition the composition is, uh, absolutely a non alloy, uh, you know that is is standard. It's an it's an aluminum alloy uh, of a non series in the Dow standards and so on. Um, it, it's uh, an alloy called silumin, S-I-L-O-M-I-N, silumin, uh, S-I-L-U-M-I-N. And uh, it's a st standard metal, mm -hmm. no, standard metal alloy. Um, so it's not, quote, alien. Okay, It wasn't made on Mars or Alpha Centauri. Uh, what was it doing there? So we are taking things apart. We're looking inside it. We're doing x-rays of it. There are strange aspects to it in terms of the metallurgy. So mm -hmm. we're not metallurgists in the, the, the team that we have, uh, but we have people from NASA, we have people who understand materials. Um, we, there is no need to look for isotopes because it's, again, it's a standard alloy. We, we, we know that. The question is, uh, what was a function, it uh, apparently was improvised. I mean, you can make that kind of thing if you have access to a good lab. It's not very difficult to mold that piece um, yourself. And then it wouldn't have a brand. Um, what is curious is that it's in the metric system very precisely. So there are attachments. We know it was held by a pin that uh, Jose got loose. Um, so, uh, I mean, he got it, you know, he wrenched so it crow, out with of the, the panel. So we don't have the panel, but we have the bracket. The, uh, we've measured all the holes and all the dimensions. It's in the metric system. The army was not using the metric system and there's no reason why aliens would use metric system. So the question is, you know, who made it and where did it come from? Now, my, I have a simple-minded interpretation that the army could have found this somewhere. You remember they were, they were improvising. They were about 20 miles away from their base, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So they were camping. They had mm -hmm. one or two Jeeps, they had a tent and uh, they were, guarding this thing and working on it, trying to gather all the debris and take it away, okay? Prepare it to take it away, loading it on this 18 wheeler. So they, uh, they may have needed to bring electricity. You can get, you can generate electricity from a Jeep. You know, I, I used to drive a Jeep and you can, you can generate power from, from the Jeep, electrical power. So they, they could have wanted to work on this at night. They may have needed a light. They may have needed power tools. So this could have been part of something they rigged on, on the site. 
you know, the army is good at that. I mean, that's that's what they do. They improvise, you know, wherever they are. So that's my interpretation. My friends here uh, when Silicon Valley, you know, uh, don't don't buy that. Or they they say, okay, Jacques, you know, maybe you're right, but we, we need to look closer. We need to reanalyze this thing. So we're having this good fight. Uh, I, I don't know what Paola thinks at this point. Uh, I think she's amused to, to, see, to see us being fighting about this, this bracket. There is no question it's human, but who made it and why? And what was it doing inside this extraordinary object that we don't understand? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, where would the object be taken? And that's, I think that's the question that the, the UFO community should be asking. Because, you know, that, we know everything about how it was loaded. They had to build a crane there in the right. field, okay? A, a, a 15 or 20 foot crane that they had to erect there to lift that thing and load it on this trailer, okay? You don't bring an 18 wheeler in the middle of nowhere where you have to build your own road and your own gate, which is gonna take two days just to take out a weather balloon, okay? This is not a weather balloon. Okay, this is complex. This is something that the army cared about. They packed it up and they took it somewhere. It's not in the Air Force Fives. I know the Air Force Fives very well. As you know, I, when I was working with Dr. Heineck in the 70s and the 80s, I built, I rebuilt the database of all the cases in Blue Book. And I know, you know, the cases in, uh, in the French Fives, in the French military Fives, in the French CNES, you know, uh, space agency files and so on. I've, I've worked with people who build those files and I've built some of my own. So this is not anywhere. It was not reported to the Air Force. There was no Air Force. Right. <laughs> there was an Army Air Force, which was part of the Army. The Air Force is not going to exist for another two years. Blue Book, you know, and a project sign and all those other projects uh, are not going to exist for year, several years, okay? So where did that thing go? Well, uh, we know it's classified. I mean, um, the who would have custody of it and what kind of clearance would you need mm -hmm. to know what has been done with it? I mean, obviously there was intense interest in anything like this. So it was taken somewhere. Uh, the most logical place would have been Los Alamos uh, in what we know of, uh, of, of Trinity, you know, um, the, the scientists there never spoke about anything like this. Uh, not Enrico Fermi, not um, Oppenheimer. Uh, it's not in the records of, uh, of any of these people. Um, the, there is no, no trace in, in those records. The, the most likely thing it, is that it was turned over to the Atomic Energy Commission, which has its own classification system, which is not secret, top secret, confidential, and so on, which, is the, which are the clearances that most of the people for example, um, you know, working on the Nimitz affair would have those clearances, top secret and then above top secret, SAP, special access programs and so on. It's uh, what everybody in Washington is talking about right now is at that level of clearance. It's above top secret. It's at the special access program level. The, the atomic secrets don't go there. They, they go to the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Energy and they stop. They don't routinely go to the executive branch on, on a higher level. They, they stop at this level because the, the atomic secrets have always had their own classification, which is, okay. which is, 
which is R, P, and Q clearances. And then the foreign, you know, foreign intelligence secrets go to the State Department and they are taken care of at the level of the State Department. They don't go to the same, same classification level uh, except on a need basis, on a need to know basis, which is the, you know, the, the architecture of the entire classification system, which makes perfect sense. So um, that is why we cannot find any trace of this particular crash. That's why it was ignored so long. Uh, the people who worked within the Air Force, uh, Project Blue Book, uh, Major Quintanilla, uh, Dr. Hynek, never knew about this. And they were never cleared to know about this. You know, uh, what's happening here, which is really interesting, is that something happened to Bill. Uh, you can see he disappeared from this interview. Uh, since we can't do the interview over again, I think he's trying to call, that's what's happening. Let's close the interview with saying that, Jacques, I'm very grateful that you were able to participate in this. You gave so much clarity to MUFON and MUFON is so important because they are the database for a lot of what the research is. And both you and I are very honored to be part of this presentation. And then what will happen is we'll find out what happened if it was uh, something voluntary or involuntary happened to the transmission with Bill. Yes. <laughs> I know, because I think that something happened uh, while you were talking about that particular aspect about the Atomic Energy Commission aspect. So well, we're recording anyway, right? I know so. we're recording this, so we have it, but we lost, uh, you know, it's kind of a message. We lost Bill here. <laughs> so anyway, well, we'll, we'll find out what happened to Bill. We'll find out, but uh, we, I thank you. So So what happened to Bill? <laughs> uh, we're here. Tell you want to? You want to make? Do you want to make a? Do you yeah. want to make a statement? I mean, do, would you like to add something to that? You know, it was interesting because it happened twice. It happened when Jacques was talking about the Atomic Energy Commission, where he thinks it really went, and then somehow in the conversation, Jacques asked me. Oh, well, you're in aerospace, or maybe it was you. And I said, yes. That was me. <laughs> and, and I said, yes. And I go out as a salesman. Sometimes I go out to, you know, the naval weapons testing area way out in China Lake in the middle of nowhere in <laughs> California. And right then again, boom, I got cut off again. <laughs> so. Not I'm us. Like, it's you. It's me, you. Me. <laughs> yeah. But. Okay. Um, so great, shall we take questions? Paula, you wanna, shall we take some oh, questions? Well, I, I can't see anything. Um, how do, we, how do you do it? So the first, uh, the first question yeah. that came in from uh, Benjamin is, how was the object found on the UFO? Could this be a piece of a plane or object the UFO collided with? So it's a great question. Paula, do you want to answer the object was actually inside the craft? The, 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 the the object, the uh, yeah, they went inside the craft. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, the little kid, you know, the nine year old. Jose. Jose went inside and he went all the way around. He saw the dome. He knows how high it was. It was on its side when he went in. And because it was on the flatbed on its side, and uh, he describes it's it's attached to the wall. It can't be part of an airplane. It's on a panel attached to the wall, and the thing spins. Right. So it's inside. It's not a piece that was just found on the floor or anything. It is against the wall. Mm -hmm. And so in Jose's mind, and you've spoken to Jose too, Tamara, Mm -hmm. It was a mechanism of some kind, and he um, wanted a a souvenir. He called it a tesoro, mm -hmm. and there's more to that. There's treasure. more. Yeah, it's a treasure. 
And there's more to the story that, uh, because when those kids took that out of there, they put hid it in the sheep herder's shack. Mm -hmm. do, do we put that in the book? You've got to read it. Yeah, the book it. is great. They hid it under the floorboards of the sheep herder's shack. And the sheep herder came into Mr. Baca the, the day after and said, I have to move away from here because three little omozitos, three little men came through the wall, came through the wall, remember the paranormal part, and asked where the tesoro was, which was under the floor, uh, the floorboards there. Mm -hmm. So if it belonged to the government, or what was, the sheep herder isn't lying. I mean, he's, he's you know, simple person. He, he isn't lying. And he says these three little men came through the wall and are looking for this thing. So if it's a government piece, why are they coming through the wall looking for this? I mean, it gets complicated. Yeah. Right. The, uh, another question related to this was, could the part shown, the piece, be a piece of the communication tower that the UFO hit? And you researched this heavily, mm -hmm. Paula, and proved that, no, it absolutely was not part of that. Can well, we how would it get inside? What it would just because the thing was totally intact. It was just one panel that on was the wall. Yep. Uh, yeah. How would it get inside the wall and attached to the wall if it was a piece right. of a right. tower? You know, we don't know what it is. We don't know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another great story that I love about this is because the kids were so innocent. Um, you know, Jose and Remy and. Jose's uh, was it cousin, Sabrina, right? Or his yeah. niece, Sabrina. His niece, yeah. Who was later a witness to the crash site, um, but not when the crash, when the UFO was there. But they would all talk about when they were little kids, they had all this stuff that looked like tinsel that you'd put on the Christmas tree. and But it was really the UFO parts of that crazy the, metal. The that part would, of the craft. So yeah, it was it what it was? They called it angel hair spider web, yeah. and there was it was all over the mesquite. There were and so mm -hmm. the boys because it was all lit up, and then we're going back and forth whether it's fiber optics or not. But it was lit up. It was different colors. It was you know purple and green and pink and everything lit up all the time. They right. put it in a big uh, you know kind of a bag, a bean mm -hmm. bag kind of thing. Ten pounds of it. And they, yeah. they trimmed the Christmas trees with it, okay? Yeah. Yeah. So they, they trimmed the Christmas trees and they put it on the windows and the people yeah. in the town saw it and they came and got some of it too. Yeah. yeah. This is from a UFO crash. You know? yeah. I, was like, I was like, I think I can see a movie right away. You start yeah. with these kids, you know, uh, trimming the tree with this fiberglass kind of thing. And then that they found on the ground from the crash, it was obviously from the inside. Um, and, then, and then you come, then it pulls away to what happened that day. No, they had real artifacts. And my finding of Sabrina at the very end last year, where she verified the foil plus the fiberglass stuff uh, or the you know, fiber optic. I don't know what that stuff was, but it, I'm sure it didn't exist in 1945. Um, that's part of it. I mean, the story is just so rich. It's part of it. Yep. And she also spoke about how the land was just scorched and yeah. for years, absolutely nothing grew there. Mm -hmm. um, another couple of questions were, uh, was there any, is there any description of what the craft looked like inside? Any seats, control area? Not that I didn't, Jose didn't say anything about that. He just went in and pulled the piece Well, off. but by that time, the military had already taken everything out of the inside. They had, they had been stripping well, it out. Well, there was nothing in the inside. Even the father I... said there was nothing. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was no seats. There was no chairs. There was no nothing. Yeah. Right. There was right. nothing. It was, uh, except that panel on the wall mm -hmm. and the dome and the dome. Remember, right. there was a little dome and Jacques asked him, he said, did you, could you go up into the dome? And he said, no. Uh, he said he, he wasn't tall enough. He was a little kid. Now, when Jacques was 15, he did see a saucer and it had a dome, mm. uh, you know, uh, on it. So there are some saucers that have a dome. This was not a saucer, but this thing had a dome. Right. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, somebody said, where is the, where is the angel hair tinsel now? And oh my God, this is what makes me so mad. Right? Why didn't people get on this before? 
There, there is none. We, there is none left. That's no, the, because the but there we know be, there could be because if somebody would go door to door because they gave it to the neighbors and ask them if they have the Christmas decorations of 1945, maybe you'd pull some of that out. <laughs> but you'd have to go door to door, and you know how small that city is. Yeah, San Antonio. And, and some of the people aren't there anymore, but maybe you could find some people. Do you, maybe your mother and grandmother have Christmas decorations from 1945. Then you'd find some of the angel hair. Right. You know, the other thing too, someone asked, was there radiation damage to the boys? And kind of on piggybacking on what you just said, that's the problem that a lot of those people that lived there, they had early deaths. And Jose even said, had he not moved out to California and eventually became a California state trooper, he would have died early, like all of his high school yeah. friends because of the radiation. They were all, yeah. all not there. radiation from the craft, remember, radiation no, from the bomb. The right. problem is that, that Jose's mother opened the door at 445 in the morning and saw this, uh, uh, what she said was, uh, uh, the light of a thousand suns. Can you imagine that? And she was blinded in one eye. And, and Jose told you even, Tamara, that his eardrum was blown out. Yeah. So, and, and Remy told me that his whole bed went to the other side of the room. I mean, these are, this is part of the story. This is part yeah. of the history in the book. I mean, that nobody told them they were going to explode the atomic bomb. And yeah. then later when they got them all together, what they told them was that it was, they exploded in an ammunition dump. What I found interesting about this case was as a field researcher, it had everything. I mean, you had a recovered crash, you had, you know, beings, you had witnesses. I mean, you had recovered pieces of metal. It has everything and the government has hidden it. And so the crazy thing is, is that as, as we've all been, Bill said before you guys arrived on your field um, expedition that the government had been there with the cats doing oh, yeah. work, trying to move everything so that you didn't come out to recover more. And then Paula, before you and I and Jose were there just last September, yeah. again, they had been out just before we arrived and they had been moving things around and they actually made a fake watering hole for animals where the UFO ended up. And now it's filled with water. And then the cockle spur is around it, which is incredibly poisonous. Yeah. Um, and then they threw like a couple of salt blocks <laughs> that you would yeah. use for a cow underneath these trees that they couldn't even get to. But okay, think about it. If you're a cow, you're not gonna go through dangerous cockle spur to go get a drink. I mean, like they've, they've just done everything they can to really prevent people from going to this site and recovering artifacts and do honest to goodness research. And so you've done an amazing job over the years of documenting it and, and researching it. And really, you know, us, us, even in spite of everything the government's been trying to do to prevent the research from being done there, it, the, the book is, is really well documented and um, really thoughtful. Yeah, I think, um... And, and, and it's very important, it's historic. I mean, yep. apart from it, it uh, being a UFO story, it's a story about the atomic bomb. Yeah, I think that because we know the exact location, there's more to be done there. And, and in the future, Jacques has an intention of working more on it. And But we don't wanna say where it is. I think it's important that yeah. it remain yep. pristine. It belongs, that land belongs to Jose Padilla. Mm -hmm. You know, it belongs to the Padilla family. Mm -hmm. It's private property. I do not want to see t-shirts, tinfoil hats, you know, bumper stickers on this case because that's what happens to every single thing in the UFO community that nobody takes seriously anymore. This is a scientific thing. We've taken scientists there and I want it to be historic. I don't want it to be commercialized entertainment. So we're having a problem with that to keep it that way, as pure as it is. Mm -hmm. um, one other question, Paula, it said, uh, what became of the little, the little beings? And if the man said they came through the wall, they were still alive. So as far as we know, the beings that were in the crashed UFO, we don't know what happened to them. No, uh, we don't, because the next day when Padilla's father and Apodaca, the, the sheriff, the, uh, they weren't in there. 
but mm -hmm. I had worked with with Clifford Stone and uh, and crash retrievals before he died, and he told me that on a lot of the ones that he went to, they came and got their own. Mm -hmm. They would come and retrieve their own beings. Yeah. So they would come. So and then, but as far as coming through the wall, they weren't alive. It was, I mean, to come through the wall, I have no, look, I have no idea what happened there. I know the guy wasn't lying. He was a sheep herder. Mm -hmm. They came through the wall, like whatever comes through the wall. And mm -hmm. of course it scared the living daylights out of me. He wanted to move out right away. You want to move away from, from New Mexico. Right. Um, another question was the entity that was photographed in your group picture at Laughlin was he wearing a blue mask, uh, the entity? No, I saw that. I just saw it now. It looked like he was wearing a blue mask. It was deep set eyes. It was reddish hair. He almost looked like he had a hat on. And I saw a bluish thing. It looked like a blue. He wasn't there, by the way. That, that, that being was not, I mean, there was nobody behind us. It came out in the picture. So I wanted to say that even in the real nuts and bolts investigation and you know Jacques is nuts and bolts yeah. he's very very yeah. nuts and bolts and I am too but what happens when you find something like that behind your shoulder it's that guy is behind my shoulder nobody knows what to make of it I mean mm -hmm. the only thing I can think of so you better be careful this year when you come to Laughlin who okay. we photograph behind you guys okay right. you better be careful if that guy shows up again behind us in pictures but, Paula, they're asking to see the photo again. Is there a way for you to pull it up in your PowerPoint presentation and then share it when you find it? Yeah, yeah, I could do it. It's in the, it, actually, it's in the last part of this. Yeah. Uh, there is the being. Wait a minute. Let me get, this is everybody. You see everybody? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead and hit share He's there. screen. You see him behind my head? No. Go yeah. ahead and hit share screen. Oh, oh. The bottom. Okay, I'm the only one seeing this. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me see where share screen. And up. if you can't, this is being recorded and everyone who has paid for this can obviously watch it again and you can see yeah. it. So yeah, I don't I, I, I can't even get back to myself here. Okay, okay, not a problem. The good news yeah. is we have Dr. Bob who has weighed in. Um, obviously, he and his son Ryan uh, also played a part in tonight's presentation. Dr. Bob said the soldiers were probably from White Sands Proving Ground the army would normally provide such personnel. What choices would be the most logical places to send such a craft? White Sands probably had been told nothing about the correct procedure. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, there was no standard operating procedures for UFO recovery in 1945, right? So they were just doing a make it up as you go thing, I would assume. Just like Jacques said, it was most likely taken to Los Alamos yeah. and then put under the Atomic Energy Commission, which then makes it much harder to find. Right. But, but since Dr. Bob uh, weighed in, they have to know, I have used that document in every one of my presentations all over the world. Mm -hmm. Oppenheimer and Einstein do not write to President Truman because they feel like it. Right. Yeah. And they certainly don't write to President Truman about having relationships with ETs. Yeah. One month yeah. before Roswell. Right, yeah. one month before Roswell. Yeah. So will people please get a clue and go to Brian Wood's website? Not only that, but Ryan wrote a book, which you can't get anymore, called uh, Magic Eyes Only, which I bought for Jacques. Um, cost me a mint. <laughs> uh, that has a 1945 case in it, because Ryan did an amazing job. Mm -hmm. And it has the 1945 case. And Dr. So, Bob. Dr. Bob asked also, have there been any documents leaked or otherwise describing the crash recovery? And I think you guys did a FOIA request, didn't you? And nothing, well, no, you guys it wouldn't been... be there, it wouldn't be there. Uh, I can tell you a story. When I talked to Remy, uh, he told me he had elected, he was, you know, Washington state. He had elected Dixie Lee, uh, governor of Washington state. So he helped elect her because he had the Hispanic caucus that elected her democratic governor. Uh, and she, to thank him, went to the Un Atomic Energy Commission files and showed him the case. Oh. Which is really crazy because 
we didn't know. Jamich energy files are the only ones the president can't see and everybody can't see. Jacques was trying to tell you that, that right. that was the most classified of classifieds. Wilbur Smith said the, that the UFO question was higher classified than the atomic bomb. Right. So here is Dixie Lee say, showing that, thank you very much for electing me here. Look real quick, this is your case, close it. And, and it's atomic and who's gonna go there and look for that? It's not in the, uh, it's not, uh, well, they would have had to go there. I mean, there's no uh, Air Force. Right. It's no, there's no <laughs> army. It's next to the, the, the bomb. So they're gonna go, this is a, a result of, I mean, this is a problem here. Uh -huh. We have a problem, you know, Houston. ETs are coming because he exploded the bomb. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. So the, you know, that, that particular, now, the funny part about it is I was doing a lecture somewhere and this guy uh, who is uh, uh, who worked for the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, he writes me and he goes, Paula, my father used to fly around Dixie Lee. You're absolutely right. There was problems with atomic, you know, when they would have sightings or something, because uh, his father had sightings in Washington state. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, you know, uh, the, this might have been the atomic energy. He said, we knew Dixie Lee and she had a dog named Jacques. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> Are That's you funny. kidding me? It's like, she, so Dixie Lee, who's the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Washington State, she worked in the Atomic Energy Commission, has a dog named Jacques. Okay, we got, uh, now let's, mm -hmm. let's <laughs> so the thing is that, yeah, there's a lot of things that, and I believe Remy, I think, I think, you know, it's too bad he's not around, but um, he always, he had another sighting too with his wife, you know, and uh, I think, I think that this is all destiny. I think that the appearance of UFOs over nuclear bases, nuclear sites, and the beginning of this history in 1945 is something that they want us to pay attention to. I agree. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the end of the questions. Unless well, anyone... I do have the picture. Do you want to see it? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try to do this. So wish me luck. Good luck, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> there, here we all are. Okay. Here's, here's, do you see it? Wait a minute. Let me just, uh, let me make this bigger. There's my head. Yeah. You see it? Okay, yeah. so I want to go to 12. There's all of us. You see that? Yeah. All of us. The guy is right behind me right here. Yeah. See it? It's behind the curtains. So why don't we do this this year, guys? Let's go take a picture at Laughlin in this very same spot. Because these are the curtains uh, on the stage yeah. in, the, yeah. in the Aquarius. Let's go take a picture and see if this guy appears again. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting situation mm -hmm. yeah i just uh because it's weird i mean i couldn't explain it i mean what do you do with something like that right. well thank I, you. I have a comment and and it's i think one of the most troubling things in a way is what jock said about this this metallurgy that was run on this object it if I understood him correctly, he's saying basically is a it's a humanoid created thing. It's a fairly common uh, alloy. And how do you explain it as affixed inside this craft if the craft is indeed alien? And I only can think of well, I can only think of two explanations, only one of which is alien, and that is that we don't know where the craft was before it got to this location. Maybe it picked something up somewhere as a kind of souvenir. And oh, that would be interesting. <laughs> that would not be funny. Sure. <laughs> that would explain it. The other thing is it that it wasn't alien in the sense of being extraterrestrial, that it was an advanced uh, piece of aeronautic equipment, uh, came from Earth. Um, this thing had a function, and we just don't know what it is. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, what what else? That's why I say it's troubling, is because it's well, he also says though, if you listen to his speeches, that all of the magnesium, the all of makings of the what's the silicon and everything is common to every planet. 
-hmm. It's common to Mars, it's common to Venus, mm -hmm. it's common to all the planets. All the functions of these metals can be found on all these planets. It's the, it's the, it's the conglomeration or the, the amount or how they put it together that may be different. So, um, you know, and then we got the problem of the three guy, little homozitos are coming through the wall. Why are they coming together? Right. I mean, it, it's yes. a mystery. It, I, I, I don't really care about metals, so it doesn't bother me at all, but it does bother the scientists. It does yep. bother them. It bothers me a little bit because it does <laughs> not only the, the metallurgy, but just the appearance of the object is pretty conventional uh, as a lever type of a, of a device. But in any case, it's uh, just one of those things. It's out there and we don't have an explanation. Well, Eric, it, you know, it's still ongoing. Like you said, he's fighting with the guys that are looking at the metallurgy. <laughs> They're having arguments. He goes, I don't know what Paula thinks. I say, keep fighting about it. And you just keep doing it. Keep, that's your job. You yes. just find, you know, just keep doing it. That's a good thing. By the way, can you give my love to Bob, Bob Wood? I absolutely adore him. And he's been very influential in my career and he and Ryan, and I thank them very much. We will do that.